Today we're looking at radical faith. What does it mean to live life in the double portion? Our engaged question this morning is what would shake your faith? Today we've got a long section of scripture that's a lot of story, and I'm going to let scripture kind of do the talking this morning. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 8. We left off last week in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 7, the story of the, the widow with a little bit of oil, and we saw how that our little bit is enough for God to use. And he sees our little bit and says, that will do. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. So we pick up the story. Elisha, the prophet, now is traveling from town to town, city to city, kind of making his rounds as the prophet would do. We're not quite sure about the timing and, and, and all of that, but we pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. What a beautiful introduction to the story, right? He's traveling around, and he, he comes and visits this one particular home in general. And the woman of the home, the wife of this husband, has a discerning spirit. And gentlemen, praise God for godly wives who have discerning spirits. Amen? Ladies, you know how to sniff them out a mile away. And you keep us guys honest in that regard. But this woman sees something in Elijah that he is of God. She says, let's prepare a place for him. And wouldn't you like it, college students, as you're looking for uh, a, a room to live in or rent in this community, that someone would just be like, hey, we're going to build a lean-to on the back of our house. We're going to furnish it with everything that you need. And while you're here, you can stay there. Sign me up, right? Kind of privacy of your own room. They get into conversation a little bit. Verse 11 of 2 Kings chapter 4. One day, Elisha returned to Shunem, and he went up to his upper room to rest. Verse 12, he said to his servant Gehazi, tell the woman from Shunem I want to speak with her. And when she appeared, Elisha said, uh, can we go back one? No, we're good. Okay, when she appeared, my bad, Candace, I'm sorry. Elisha said to Gehazi, tell her, we appreciate the kind concern you have shown us. What can we do for you? That's Elisha's go-to phrase, right? He approaches someone and says, what can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army in verse 14? No, she replied, for my family takes good care of me. So she's provided for the prophet. She's given him room to, to sleep in, a place to be. And the prophet comes back and says, is there anything that we could possibly do for you? And perhaps this is a test of faith for her, for Elisha to kind of see what her, mo her motives might be. This woman has been kind to Elisha and, and his servant. Maybe, just maybe, she wants something out of it. But no, she's perfectly content in her situation. She says, I've got my family. My family takes good care of me. I live among the people. My needs are provided for. There is nothing that I could possibly need. She simply wished to honor God and the prophet. In this passage, Paul echoes in some ways in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, where he puts verse 11 through 13, not that, I have, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. There's this contentment that this woman has, that even when the prophet says, hey, blank check, what can I do for you? She says, no, 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 no. All of my needs are completely and utterly met. question I have for you this morning is, are you content? Are you satisfied? Do you believe that God has provided enough for you? Or maybe you're finding meaning and fulfillment in something other than God. Because here's the thing, if you're finding meaning somewhere else and you're chasing after more, you will never have enough. More brings 
desire for more. More is the enemy of enough. There's no amount of money or things that can bring true satisfaction. It's only found in Jesus Christ. But Elisha's serious. He wants to do something for this woman. So we continue the story, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 14. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, what can we do for her? And Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. And I, don't know about, I don't know about you, but have you ever uh, remembered that you were invited to a wedding or a birthday party, and the, the, the party is supposed to happen at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, you remember at like 2 o'clock? You're like, what am I going to get for this person? Is there something in my house that has been gifted to me that I've... No, you wouldn't do that, right? No regifting. No, 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 no. Can we swing by Target on the way to the party or to the wedding and find something for them? And you're rushing back and forth. What can we get this person? Uh, the sense of urgency maybe here isn't, uh, isn't quite clear, but Elisha says, hey, sir, we've got to do something. What can we do for her? And they maybe went to Target in Israel, and they were pacing the aisleways back and forth, and like, can we get her a card and write a little like, like nice thank you note on it? Or maybe she like scented candles. Can we get one for her? Gezai says, no, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. And we got to say sorry, bro, to the husband, because he's just uh, defined as an old man here. He's, and, and, but there's significance to that, right? Because maybe, just maybe, they're not going to be able to have a child because he is old. And in this culture and in this time, having a son meant everything. Because there's likely an age gap between this woman and her husband, and he would be the one to die first. And if there was not a son to take care of her afterwards, she would be on her own. And Gehazi recognizes this. Verses 15 through 17, 2 Kings chapter 4. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to, to, said to her as she stood in the doorway, Next year, at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. She says, No, my lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant, and at that time, the following year, she had a son just as Elisha had said. Elisha offers to her maybe the desire that's in her heart, but it's something that's, that maybe they've prayed about for years and she hasn't been able to conceive. Maybe it, it, it's been something on the back of her mind that she's not even willing to articulate, but she longs for a son to pass down to him the teachings of God, to be a provider and care for her as her husband is gone. And she says, no, 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 like, don't get my hopes up. Like, that's something that, like, we've prayed about it. We've seen all the specialists. Like, no, don't get my hopes up. Don't promise me that because that is a big promise. She almost has the incredulity of Abraham or Sarah in Genesis chapter 17 and 18 when they're told that they're going to have offspring, a son, a promised son in their old age. Sarah kind of says, yeah, 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 you're funny. Like, you know, that, that time has passed. That ship has sailed. Things have changed. And you don't get it. Maybe Zacharias in, in Luke chapter 1, who is, is struck mute because of his disbelief of God providing a son for him in his old age. But it's a very real reality of, of longing to be able to have children and not be able to have them. The story continues on. This son of promise is, is given to this woman. He, he grows up to be of a certain age. 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 18 continues on, a time jump. One day, when her child was older, he went out to help his father, who was working with the harvesters. He's likely at least 13 years, of old, 13 years of age. Suddenly, he cried out, my head hurts, my head hurts. His father said to one of the servants, carry him home to his mother. Soon, the servant took him home, and his mother led him, uh, held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband, send one of the servants on a donkey so that I can bring, uh, so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go today, he asked. Is it, it's neither the new moon festival nor a Sabbath, but she said, it will be all right. 
servants. Verse 24. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down until I tell you. Pedal to the metal. And as she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance and said to Gehazi, look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, is everything all right with you, your husband, and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi, everything is fine. Have you ever had those moments where your world gets turned completely upside down? The expectation that you had for your life is shifted because of a new reality that has come over your way of being. The son that she had longed for, the one that was promised of God, that had come to her at a time where she thought, maybe I can't have children, is now dead. And Gehazi's servant comes to her and says, is is everything all right? You, your husband, your child? She says, yes, everything's fine. What's interesting is this woman was a discerning woman because she could pick up on the fact that Elisha was a trustworthy man, but she's not so sure about Gehazi. Fine. Everything's fine. It also reminds me of the meme that goes around on the internet occasionally, you know, the dog in the house that's like, this is fine. This is going to be okay. My whole world is crumbling down around me, but this is fine. This woman has radical faith in the midst of great loss, but she doesn't quite trust that servant. So she comes to Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 27 through 28. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Can you imagine? She's weeping and holding on to the ankles of the prophet, crying out before him. And Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, leave her alone. She is deeply troubled, but the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, don't deceive me and get my hopes up? She's angry. She says, I didn't sign up for this. This was not part of the plan, not something that I was desirous of. You placed this on my lap, and now my son is gone. Didn't I say, don't get my hopes up? Didn't I say, don't take me through this? Because it would have been better to not have a son than to have one and to lose him. Elisha, the ball is in your court. And here's the thing that we have to wrestle with in the face of grief and loss, right? There's this idea of our, our head faith, right? We can have a knowledge that God will provide, that God is faithful. But sometimes our heart, our heart faith says, where do we go from here? I didn't sign up for this. I didn't choose to be a part of this, but I find myself in this difficult situation. Our intellectual theology can tell us that, yeah, everything's going to be all right. And it's, it's easy to say, yeah, all things work together for good. Imagine saying this to this woman who has just lost her son, the son of promise. She says, like, yeah, I get that, but like, really? I didn't sign up for this. Our experiential theology sometimes clashes with our intellectual theology. And sometimes the head outweighs the heart, and it should because the heart is deceitful above all things, but we still have to wrestle with real emotion. This woman is suffering deep loss. All that she had hoped for was found in the son of promise given to her, and now he's gone. But there's a piece of hope inside of her. She's clinging to the prophet. It propels her to the prophet. There's something that he must. Can't he do this? And here's the thing when it comes to these difficult situations where life has been turned upside down. God is big enough to handle all our grief. To bring that before God. And I, by the way, Elisha is the representative of God for the Israelite nation. He is walking among the people of God, representing, being the go between between them. And the only person that she has access to is Elisha. And she bears her heart and soul before him, bringing it before God and saying, I didn't sign up for this. I didn't want to come to Keen. Well, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Coker. I didn't want to lose this person that I love. I didn't want to leave King. Okay, some of us like really, you know, are trying to get out of here, right? But God is big enough to handle all our grief. 
to take before him our real thoughts and our real feelings so that he, he's big enough to handle them. He's the one that created you to have them. Go figure that his arms are wide enough to embrace you in love during your time of loss and grieving. Here's how Elisha responds, verse 29. Then Elisha said to Gehazi, get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. She's still not trusting Gehazi. She's like, there's something up with this guy. And next week, we're gonna, uh, Pastor Reuben's going to uh, be here to, to preach, continue on this message. And he's going to cue us in maybe a little bit to why Gehazi, there's something up with him. And this also harkens back to Elisha and Elijah when Elijah is being taken up and Elijah says, stay here while I go. And Elisha says, as long as God's living and you're living, I'm with you. And that's what this woman says to Elisha. I know that you have the source of power and strength and healing. You're the one that got me into this mess. You're going to be the one to get me out of it. So Elisha returned with her. Verse 31. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him, the child is still dead. Gehazi's efforts fall in vain. Goes on to check, brings back word, yeah, the child's dead. And it, 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 if you ever prayed a prayer and God hasn't answered, maybe just maybe there's a hope that this is going to be taken care of and he comes back and he says, it's not good news. They continue on, verse 32 of 2 Kings chapter 4. When Elisha arrived, the man who is the man of God, the representation of God on this earth during this time, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then stretched himself out again on the child. This time, the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Verse 36, then Elisha summoned Gehazi, called the child's mother, and he said, and when, uh, he said, and when she came in, Elisha said, here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. And then she, sh- she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. An incredible miracle has just happened in front of our eyes. And there's some weird stuff that happens, right? There's the, the CPR kind of thing, and it's, it's weird that Elisha stretches out his, his hands over it. It's like he's laying on top of the boy, and there's some scholars that'll be like, oh, he's getting the body warm so that the soul can come back. It's like, no, 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 like, I don't know why Elisha does what he does. It's what he's compelled to do. He's a man of God who's being led by God, and if Elisha wants to do that, like, go for it. But here's maybe the imagery and the symbolism that I want us to pick up from this. As Elisha is on his knees and pacing the room and laying on top of the boy, he is standing in between the boy and God and saying, I'm in the gaps, God. Aren't you going to do something? I, God, you, you, you promised. You made this happen. Now, aren't you going to do something now? And God honors the prayers of Elisha. And it's easy for us to come away from the story and we could clap and cheer and, you know, like, oh, sweet, storm's over, like everything's healed and go back to normal. But here's the thing. Some of us are still in verse 33 of 2 Kings chapter 4, where Elisha is on his knees and pacing around the room, praying for God to act. Verses 34 through 37 haven't happened for you. Maybe it's been hours, maybe it's been days, maybe it's been weeks, months, years, but verses 35 to 37 haven't happened. The miracle hasn't come. You're in verse 33 saying, God, won't you do something? God, won't you answer my prayer? You've been in that room praying. God, won't you do something? You've you've had to walk out of that room with a person lying still and lifeless. God, why didn't you do something? God, you didn't answer my prayer. But I would offer to you today that God hasn't answered your prayer yet. 
is how I know. Prophets and Kings, page 240, talking about this story. Ellen White writes this. Jesus comforts our sorrow for the dead with a message of infinite hope. She goes on to quote three passages. Isaiah 13, verse 14, puts it this way. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? Revelation chapter one, verse 18. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 will be very familiar to those of you that were with us this summer. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive and remain on this earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. Some of us are still in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 33. 34 through 37 is coming for you. And I don't know why someone has been ripped from your life. I don't know. I, it, it, the, the, it's the perennial question. Why, God? Why did this person have to suffer? Why do we have to have loss? Why did the attacks have to happen 20 years ago? Why, God? And God says, my child, I'm going to make all things new, whether in this life or the life to come. Trust and hold on to my faithfulness for you. The story is told of Horatio Spafford in 1871. He and his wife and his four daughters are about to set sail across the Atlantic to Europe. There's the Chicago fire that happens and his business burns down. And he's, he says, no, I, I've got I to stay. Wife and daughters, you guys go ahead and go. Two to three days into their voyage, their ship runs into another one, and both ships sink, taking with it over 200 people. There's a small fishing vessel that's out there, comes along and sees the body of a woman floating on some of the debris, and it turns out to be Horatio's wife boat picks her up and takes her back to land and she gets the medical attention that she needs and she survives the catastrophe but her four daughters do not. Writes a message back to her husband and says, I survived alone, what do we do now? And Horatio takes a, a ship over to Europe and the captain of the ship tells him as they're approaching the place where, her, where his daughters are lying in their rest underneath the waters and says, this was about the place where they died. And he's overwhelmed with grief, asking the why God questions, and he pens these words. The deck of the ship waves, the spattering of the water coming over him, when peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. I encourage you today to hold on like the woman of Shunem did. And don't let go. Because whether it's now in the immediate present or it's sometime in the future, God will make all things right. I can't tell you why it's happened. We could philosophize for days, weeks, months, years. It's been all of humanity to figure out why sin has been so evil and corrupt. But one thing I know is that God loves you. And he welcomes you with open arms to say, come to me, bear your emotions and your grief before me. And maybe, just maybe, like Horatio who stood on the deck of that ship mourning the loss of his daughters, could, we could say with him, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that has taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul.